There is a stark and almost disturbing contrast between the high-tech equipment used by these health workers and the rural African setting of those they have come to protect from the ravages of the rare but deadly Marburg virus. Behind the masks, gloves and sweltering confines of the so-called astronaut suits are aid workers, doctors, virologists and epidemiologists. They've descended on the small town of Wiege in northern Angola to deal with the biggest outbreak of Marburg ever. Efforts by the Angolan government and aid organizations to isolate the Marburg virus means getting in and out of reach is extremely difficult. We're currently on a chartered flight into the town, which is at the very epicenter of the outbreak. It's a trip that normally takes about 14 hours by road. Ironically, air transport is one of the ways this virus can be spread to other areas. Weijia's isolation may be the one thing that will stop the epidemic from spiraling out of control. Before Marburg came along, few people even knew that Weijia existed. The provincial hospital had five doctors serving 20,000 people. And it was in these wards that the epidemic took off in October last year, rampaging through the pediatric ward, infecting hospital staff until 17 health workers were dead. The virus spread, carrying stigma and fear. Now the people of Ouija don't shake hands. The warm embraces are gone, and a bowl of disinfectant is the welcome to many homes. The Marburg virus first surfaced in 1967, when lab workers experimenting with African green monkeys for polio vaccines in Marburg, Germany, as well as Frankfurt and Belgrade, got sick. One died. In 1975, it resurfaced in South Africa, when an Australian traveler en route from Zimbabwe became ill, ironically, in a town called Marburg. He died. In the 80s, there were two cases in Kenya, and then a major outbreak took hold in the mining town of Durba in the DRC, leaving 128 dead between 1998 and 2000. Now it's Angola's turn. The death toll for the province stands at 136 as of today, and there's no end in sight. International aid agencies have been pouring into Weij. The World Health Organization has mobilized its Global Outbreak and Alert Response Network, or GOAN, an ad hoc team of international experts. The highly organized and dedicated team includes logisticians, anthropologists, virologists, pathologists, and medical specialists to deal with the outbreak. One of these is South African microbiologist Professor Adriano Duze. He flew in last week to head an infection control team running the so-called safety ward at the hospital. There was a huge amount of suspicion on the, the part of the community. Uh, there were some rumors that the hospital was in fact the source of the outbreak. Uh, many people are also scared of coming out of the diagnosis, and so rather than report to the healthcare facility, will stay at home. Malaria claims 40,000 lives a year in Angola, but with the Marburg virus, death is so much more brutal. The early symptoms include a fever, rash, headaches, and sore joints, then vomiting and diarrhea set in, until finally, as the virus moves through the system, attacking the internal organs, patients suffer massive hemorrhaging and bleed from every orifice. The general ethic of most doctors is to preserve life. And you can immediately tell almost at a gut level which patients are not Marburg and which patients are. And you also at a gut level know that when you see those patients bleeding and prostrate, the only treatment that we can give them is supportive and we know that they frequently will actually come out of our facility again. In the safety ward, patients with Marburg-like symptoms are screened and tested. Those who test positive or seem highly probable are destined for the Marburg isolation ward, just across the courtyard. If we make the decision, and really that's where we've got a huge responsibility, whether we're going to send them across to the isolation ward or not, we've got to be extremely cautious. I think the isolation ward can be extremely traumatic. And we have indeed seen many cases of patients that have expressed a concern and fear. We try and counterpart this fear by counselling patients. 
and telling them that really that is a safe place. We've got excellent infection control practices in the isolation ward, and we do our very best to make sure that they go in a place where they will be looked after and they will be treated comfortably. The ward is run by Médecins Sans Frontières. Here, confirmed and suspected Marburg cases are cared for under stringent safety measures. This part of the hospital is strictly off limits, but we were given exclusive access to film inside the ward. First, we were taken through the preparation stages by Luis Enchinas, medical coordinator for the MSF. The virus is transmitted through contact with infected body fluids like blood, urine, saliva and vomit. Health workers who come into direct contact with infected people and corpses need to take extreme precautions. These include three layers of gloves, goggles and no skin showing at all. Our cameraman put on an astronaut suit and we wrapped a camera in plastic wrap to film exclusive footage inside the ward. Family and friends are allowed to visit and there is a place for people to observe the restricted zone. In the confirmed Marburg ward, there was only one patient. The rest of the ward was empty. There's very little doctors can do for Marburg patients besides rehydrate and try to treat pain and fever. At the moment, the patient that has arrived to our ward, they have arrived very late, in a very late stage of, of their disease. So, of course, the prognosis is much worse than... In the suspected ward, there were two patients. Here, they're monitored and blood is taken to test for the virus. Invasive procedures like intravenous strips are not used because of the danger of contamination by infected blood. There is a recovery ward, but it's empty. Only one patient in this unit has recovered, although doctors know of two others in the community. Chlorine kills the virus and is used liberally in three different concentrations throughout the isolation ward. Most materials used or taken into the ward are incinerated. And, uh, some yes, we do blood tests on all the patients. We try to minimize the, the amount of material that we keep inside yeah, keep the water it because it's all contaminated in here, so yeah. major stock is outside. Because the conditions are so harsh, the protective clothing so claustrophobic, and the potential for mistakes so lethal, staff never work more than a two-hour shift in the ward, and rarely spend more than three weeks in Wiege. Okay, we are here to isolate people and to try to to, to break the outbreak of, of Marburg. So it's, it's very hard to, uh, to really focus on the public health point and not uh, exactly to say to clinical uh, patient in order because we have no treatment except the, the symptomatic treatment. The majority of Marburg deaths do not come from the hospital or the isolation ward. Instead, they are picked up by the WHO mobile contact teams that trawl the muddy slums for the sick, the dying, and the dead. We went out with this team led by William Perea, an epidemiologist from Colombia. The problem now is that, is that they are calling us for the bodies. We are running after the epidemic. We are, we are not being effective. When they first entered Wiege, the mobile teams and their high-tech gear were met with fear, distrust and anger. Earlier this month, they had to suspend operations after being stoned and attacked in some areas. Uh, in the traditional system, there is every, every time there is a sort of... The, 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 when they explain a problem, they are looking every time who is the responsible, who sorcerer or witchcraft went to take the, 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 the illness and bring it in the, in, into the community. Dr. Julian Anoko is an anthropologist with the WHO social mobilization teams that put considerable effort into combating the biggest factors fueling the outbreak, superstition, ignorance, and a deep distrust of Western medicine. We had some incidents with, with the community because they were not understanding that a person would that have to be, uh, have to enter in a sort of bag and uh, they were afraid. Last week, for example, 
a pregnant woman. She was seven months. Uh, she was pregnant, and she began vomiting uh, blood. The, the husband closed the door, as we recommended, and the wife was crying, crying, crying. And when we arrived there, it was too late. She was dying, and the husband was uh, was foolish. He was crying. He told me, "I leave. I abandon my wife." I abandoned my wife. Why do you think that I'm going to leave now? If I, I abandon my, my wife, she died alone. Every day, the World Health Organization's mobile contact teams visit an area where someone is either sick or dead. There's been a death in the house behind us, and the team's currently negotiating for access to the body. The mobile teams have learned from experience. They only put on their suits after expressing their condolences, consulting the family, and involving them in the process. After the team takes blood to test for the virus, the family is told how to deal with the body and given protective clothing. In, in a normal situation, for example, when there is a, a dead a funeral, what they do is expose the dead body somewhere or in a, on the bed, and they, they kiss him. They, all they are dancing all around the bed, kissing him, uh, uh, crying but singing too. But now with Marber, we don't recommend the contact, and there is a sort of shock. Marburg has changed things. Here, the team goes to a 20-year-old woman who died in a vehicle before her family could get her to hospital. After consulting her husband, the team decides to remove her body immediately. Before burial, the corpse must be conditioned or sprayed with chlorine, which kills the virus. Her husband assists the team and will be allowed to bury his wife, albeit without washing the body. Year in which, when there is a, a, a funeral, every assistant has to wash their hand in a bucket of water. And now we are using that, but disinfecting, putting bleach into the water. And we do the epidemic. We control the epidemiologic situation. And the, rit the, the ritual is going on, continue. Although this is a, is a painful exercise for the family, for us, for everybody, uh, it's the only way we are going to build that bridge, you know? and we hope that that soon, sooner than later, they will finally understand that we are, we are they can trust us and they will call us when when the people is just getting sick. But we are not there yet. We are not there yet. Okay. There are some signs that the tide is turning in Weege and that life will one day return to normal. The song against Marburg, composed by local musician Amadeo Cardoza and performed here by the Marburg Trio, urges the people out of denial about the disease. It's played on local radio and from loudspeakers around town. Cardoza composed the song in memory of a musician friend who died of Marburg, along with almost his whole family. How does it make you feel to know that people that you share this town with have lost their lives to the Marburg virus? Bem, é uma angústia, né? Porque sempre que perdemos um ser humano, ainda que não seja teu amigo, isto é preocupante. Então, quanto mais são pessoas nossas queridas, então nós ficamos angustiados. Mas não podíamos cruzar os braços. Tínhamos que fazer alguma coisa para que não morresse muita gente. É a luta que estamos a fazer. Vamos com as equipas técnicas. O centro de isolamento não está para matar o doente. The epidemic is far from over, and a number of questions remain unanswered. Like, where does Marburg come from, and where does it hide? Professor Robert Swanepoel from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in Johannesburg is an expert on hemorrhagic fevers. Since the first Ebola outbreak in 1995, he's been trying to find the reservoir, or the carrier, of the Marburg and Ebola viruses. It would have to be an organism that the virus doesn't kill, as it does humans and monkeys. We regard this as the holy grail. It's like Mount Everest. It's out there. Nobody's climbed it. And as long as it's not been climbed, there's something, yeah, we're excited. After the 1988 outbreak in the DRC, Swanepoel went searching for the Marburg Reservoir. The outbreak was traced to a mine that was full of bats, and he found genetic evidence of the virus in bats. The research continues. The people on the ground controlling the outbreak, the WHO, NGOs like Medicines on Frontier, 
who are excellent at their job. But they all have priorities and you come and you want to do something else and they say, no, no, hang on, wait, now's not the time. And then you do wait and then later on the trail has gone cold looking for the reservoir. Professor, in non-scientific terms, how would you characterise the Marburg virus? Is it a silent assassin? Is it a biological terrorist? It's we that create the situation and, and help it along. By itself, if, it's, if it were lying on the floor there, it can do nothing for itself. It, it holds up or lives in some other animal somewhere else quietly and peacefully, gets into humans and then people start bleeding and so on and other people expose themselves through lack of knowledge. Okay, and of course hospitals can very often be a problem. Hospitals cause epidemics, but the problem is poverty really. Has a vaccine been developed? There are people that are academically getting grants now and have worked on vaccine and have had success. The game has become extremely expensive. No longer everybody in their own backyard making vaccines. It's all centralised in a few big hands in the world. And you tell a company that you know, sells millions of doses of measles or something to make what's the demand for Ebola or Marburg vaccine. You make uh, 100,000 doses. This outbreak goes away now. Who's going to buy it? What should South Africa be doing in this particular instance? We've done the right things, but we can't swear that it won't happen here because there are thousands of South Africans working up there. There are people travelling to and fro from countries all over the world. The other day we had somebody sick on a plane who was just passing through South Africa. This is how the majority of people in Weege live. There's no running water, no electricity and no sanitation. It's conditions like these that make containing the Marburg virus such a logistical nightmare. For aid workers, it's a daily struggle against trying conditions, both physical and psychological. So when you come home, you really feel like having a good shower, soap and... I mean, even if there is, if there is no water, water, but have enough water, to, where you can soak with enough water and wash yourself properly and put on uh, clean clothes. This is not for the faint-hearted. We often have to debrief ourselves in the evening. We have seen some terrible sights. Um, you can see it on our faces as the day progresses. Um, it's really extremely difficult and we're finding it quite hard to cope. Although they take every conceivable precaution, health workers are in the front line when it comes to contracting Marburg. A hemorrhagic fever in general, there is no therapy for it. If I would die from Marburg, this would really be something I want to avoid because I think my children need me. If a patient is not bleeding, we would like to have eye contact with our patients. We would like to actually talk to them and not make them feel fearful. We find that we get better clinical information and also better epidemiological information if we do that. But uh, we're also not heroes, and this is not a job for anybody that comes in with a heroic attitude. For me, it is urgent to save people that are relieved more than crying those that are dead.